and he obviously picked the perfect protagonist for his art style. Oh, it's just so, so impressive and so stressful at the same time. Thank you to everyone who requested him, because I hadn't heard of him before, and now I'm obsessed with his artwork. After the Illustrator Reacts to Good and Bad Manga Art episode, I started getting way more requests for manga artists to cover. And I've recently started reading more manga myself, so I figured it's a good time to do another manga-focused episode. This time I'm specifically talking about artists that were very heavily requested. And now, I know the last time I did a requests-focused episode, I went through the artists a lot faster, and people weren't as big of a fan of that, because I didn't get to go as far in depth with any of them. So I'm not doing that this time, I'm taking the usual amount of time with each artist, but I'm calling this a requests episode because A, you know, it's requested artists, and B, because I can't call this a good and bad art episode because I'm pretty much exclusively talking about art that I found incredibly impressive. So sorry to the people who are fans of me talking about quote unquote bad art, but admittedly, this is a little bit more fun for me anyway. I really like talking about the good stuff. And of course, because this is a request episode, we've got to start with the two most requested artists that I've seen in the comment sections. Now, either of these images on their own would have impressed me so much, but it impresses me so much more looking at both of these images and knowing that they're done by the same artist because they are rendered so differently. In the black and white image, the muscling is all done with very intricate cross-hatching, whereas in the color image, there's almost no cross-hatching at all, and the body and muscles and shading are done in a much more painterly style. And a lot of time when artists are starting to get more into coloring, what they'll do is they'll do their inks as they would as always, and then do the coloring on top of that. But Boichi very clearly decides ahead of time whether the image is going to be black and white or color, and does the line work differently depending on where he's going with it. So if he's going to be doing something like a cover that's going to be in color, he'll keep the line work very simple knowing that he's going to detail it in the coloring stage. It just shows off such an impressive artistic range. And he won't even exclusively do black and white art with lots of cross-hatching. You can see in this set of images, there is cross-hatching in here in some of the smaller details, but a lot of the shading and lighting in this, even in a black and white image, he's doing ink washes to do most of the shading and lighting. So this is an artist that doesn't just have one rendering style, he actively decides between each project how he's going to render things. And I also just think it's so impressive how you can still very clearly tell it's his style when he's switching up his rendering style so much. And just in general, his colors are absolutely gorgeous. It, personally, it's probably my favorite colored manga art that I've ever seen. It's so beautiful. And I looked into his process for coloring. If I show the images that he had up, I might have to crop them a bit because they're not exactly safe for work. But he'll start working traditionally, do the thumbnail sketches, do the inking traditionally, and do some ink washing in different parts to add a little bit of real life texture, and then bring it into Clip Studio to do the flatting, and Photoshop to do the rendering of the colors. That was his process in 2017. I assume it hasn't changed, but I guess it might have. And then also, Finally for him, I just had to talk about this drawing of this back, because he very clearly has an incredible understanding of anatomy and muscle and where all the different muscles go. His style is such a great blend of realistic muscles and realistic rendering with some really nice, beautifully rendered manga-style faces. And on this back drawing, I just, I, I love the thick black outline around the character, contrasting with the, the light, intense cross-hatching to do all of the details of the muscle. So beautiful. Thank you to everyone who requested him, because I hadn't heard of him before, and now I'm obsessed with his artwork. So much of Ichiro Oda's art has such incredible depth to it. He's someone who's very good at making stuff feel closer, farther, in the middle distance. He has a really strong understanding of distance and depth and space. And he really exaggerates it in a lot of his images. Now, I've also been told that his art can be a little bit divisive, and I understand that because it is very stylized. The expressions are huge, the perspective is really stretched and pushed a lot of the time, and it's all very purposely done in an exaggerated way, but I could also see why some people don't love that. It's kind of the same reason that a bunch of people can't really get behind one of my personal favorite artists, Umberto Ramos, because he's got very stylized, exaggerated body proportions that can seemingly change up a bit between panels. 
but I think it works so well for the kind of characters he wants to draw and the stories he wants to tell. And he obviously picked the perfect protagonist for his art style. Luffy having the sort of Mr. Fantastic style stretchy powers is just so perfect for Oda's artwork. I particularly love this punch shot and just a bunch of Oda's different punch images are so impactful because of how elastic -y and exaggerated his art is. And the art of his that I'm personally most drawn to, partially because I'm a big fan of color, are the color spreads that he does for a bunch of the covers. I just think they're so beautiful and you get the, the color helps push the depth that much more and you can really see how he deals with a big scene. He's also very clearly really great at rendering out environments and buildings. Now to end, I should mention that there's one other controversial thing about him, and that's his advice for how to draw female characters, which is that he's said to draw three circles and an X. You know, I wouldn't personally advise following that direction, but, you know, to each their own. Depends what kind of art you're trying to make, I guess. But overall, my main takeaway is that Oda is a master of punches and depth. Also, I was having a bit of a hard time trying to figure out what to talk about for Ichiro Oda until a subscriber named David helped me out, sent me a bunch of artwork specifically to talk about. Thanks so much, David. That was super helpful. And I hope I did you proud in this episode. Now, next up, I can actually reference the manga because I just read the first volume of Tokyo Ghoul and I love the art so much. Sui Ishida did such fantastic work in this. It's so high contrast and... As I was going through it, I was trying to figure out something that I could specifically talk about, something that really caught my eye, a panel that would work really well to cover, and finally, as I was getting near the end, I found this panel right here, which I both absolutely love and was a little bit frustrated by. The drawing part of this image is so, so great at making us move from right to left. But the problem is when you switch it from Japanese to English and the writing on it becomes BAM that you're supposed to read from left to right, it just totally shakes up how my eye wants to go through the image. And there's not much way around that. I mean, they could potentially have just not put the writing in, but it is nice from kind of a graphic design layout standpoint. It's just that the text is trying to get you to read one way while the image is trying to make you read the other way. So that's, you know, a little bit frustrating, but not really anyone's fault because there's not much way around that when English is meant to be read from left to right. But ignoring that part of it, the drawing itself is just so fantastic because you can really feel the impact. And what I particularly love about it is the distance between the character as he's moving through the air. Between the first and second image of him, there's more space than between the second and third. And that's because Sui Yoshida is very clearly an artist that understands movement. And the fact that the character would be moving fastest right off the impact, right when he's hit, that's when he's got the highest velocity. And then the more he moves, the more his body's gonna kinda slow down. If this was being animated, the character would probably be at those distances between the different frames to help make them feel like they're fast and a little bit slower. And then just the way the character's spinning, I think is just so cool and really makes it feel like a stressful hit as he's flying through the air about to slam to the ground. Another thing that I really love about this comic before I move on is the fact that it seems like when the character is in danger, the gutter of the comic switches to black the gutter being the space between the different panels. And when it's more of a drama scene or the character's not in trouble, the gutters stay white, which I think is a really nice, subtle slash, I guess not so subtle way of kind of switching your brain into, oh, I gotta be worried right now. It's a really nice touch and I'm super excited to move on to the second volume of this manga because I, I really like it so far. Okay, this art, it stresses me out to look at it. I, I, it's gorgeous and phenomenal, but why would you do this to yourself? This probably goes without saying, but if your character design is incredibly detailed, your comic is going to take way longer to make because you have to draw that same pattern and texture and detail on that character over and over and over and over and over again. So this comic must have taken ages because there are so many intricate, textures and patterns on the clothing and carpets, environments, characters. It, I, I don't even know if I'd be able to read this comic because I would just be thinking the whole time, 
Oh, you gotta draw that again and again and again. And it is so incredibly impressive, Mori Kearu's understanding of how cloth moves and bends, which you have to have if you're gonna do something like this. Because not only do you have to do a good job showing how something that is flat but bends is twisting around and moving, falling over a character or blowing in the wind, but you have to know how your flat pattern is bending and moving around the object as well. It kind of makes me think about, and this is kind of a tangent, but the 1992 Aladdin movie, where the carpet in that had a very intricate pattern, and obviously in animation, it would take forever to draw that frame by frame, so what they did instead is they 2D animated the carpet without any texture to it, and then 3D animated the texture on top of that. Which is a clever solution, but obviously, Mori is like, Nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw these textures over and over again. Unless I'm wrong and she does use some kind of stock pattern, but I highly doubt it. They really look like she's drawing them over and over, which is so impressive. I mean, I would hate to do that, but good on you. And what's also really nice about having patterns and textures this in depth is it can really help you draw the reader's face to the character's faces because that's one of the higher points of contrast. The characters have big, dark eyes and really simple, plain white kind of faces, which is almost a little bit sad now that I think about it because you're drawing people's eyes to the least detailed part of the image, the part that she likely spent the least amount of time on. Also, this, the art that we're looking at is all from a manga called A Bride Story. Mori Kearu has a bunch of other fantastic artwork. She doesn't always do insanely in-depth textures, but this is obviously the artwork of hers that impressed me the most. She strikes me as a bit of an art masochist, but incredibly impressive nonetheless. Now, if you've watched Illustrator Reacts before, you can probably peg a lot of the stuff that I want to say about this first drawing. So I'll speed through them first, because I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I love the color contrast. The yellow really makes the main character stand out. A lot of these glass shards are very explicitly arrows pointing us to the main character. The background's got a bit of a swirly toilet bowl effect, bringing us into the main character also. Everything about this piece is really bringing our eye to the main focus. Great job there, I love it. Okay, I know I talk about this a lot, so I'll move on. And it was actually kind of hard trying to figure out what to talk about for Posuka Demizu's art, because so much of the stuff that was coming to me is stuff that I've talked about in depth before, which is all really fantastic, the way he guides your eye through the image in different pieces, the way he does coloring. But once I'd looked at a bunch more, the two things that really stood out to me, one of them was still a coloring thing, is the fact that he's really good at working with both desaturated color palettes and bright, vibrant, poppy color palettes. If we switch away from this cover and look at this drawing of this Spinosaurus and the, the girl, I don't know what the context is for this one, I'm sorry. This is a much more reserved, desaturated color scheme, and it works just as well as the bright, vibrant, poppy stuff. The head of the dinosaur is really standing out because it's more detailed and textured against the sky that's a little bit more lighter washed out. I want to talk about how the dinosaur's body is guiding us through the image, but I won't. I mean, I did, but I won't. And there's just a very clear difference between the coloring style in this and the covers for The Promised Neverland, where the yellows really pop, the blues are very saturated and bright. And then there are some examples where he shows that he can do sort of a kind of middle ground where like if you look at this image here, there's some very bright vibrant blues, but it's also a pretty reserved color palette. I just think it's so cool seeing how well he can utilize different color schemes. And the other thing that I found really interesting about Pasuka's art is the sort of scratchy feel to a lot of the line work. There's no really straight direct lines and a lot of artists early on will struggle with trying to draw really straight lines for their finished artwork. A lot of people's rough work early on can look a lot better than their finished stuff because the searching lines add a sort of texture to the character. Whereas in the finishing stage, you might be taking a bunch of rough lines and trying to figure out how to do one line for that area. And then when you get rid of the roughs, it looks very under detailed in comparison. But I think this style is a really good one to show people that to make good art, you don't have to do really straight lines in your finished artwork. In fact, I had a teacher when I was in school for animation when I, I specifically asked them, how can I get better at drawing straight lines? And his answer was, don't worry about it. It's not as important as you think. These pieces still look really nice and finished, even though most of the line work is... I don't want to say sloppy, because that makes it sound like an insult, but hopefully you get what I mean from saying that. And also, I think the sort of 
splotchy, watercolory coloring to this really helps sell the style. Kohei Horikoshi, I personally consider to have the perfect art style that's a blend of manga and cartoon. It's got such good, broad appeal while still being pretty stylized, and you can still quickly peg that it's his work. Admittedly, I'm much more familiar with the anime than the manga. I'm a huge fan of the anime, but I've also been really impressed as I've been looking through the art in the manga. But the thing that stands out the most to me personally is how he designed the faces and specifically the eyes for each character. Because a lot of artists, depending on their style, will draw the same kind of eyes for different characters so that there's consistency. But with a style that's a bit more cartoony, you can push that a lot more. And the upside of that is you can really get a character's personality across through their eyes. As humans, we're pretty much programmed to always look for an expression and specifically look at people's eyes. So if you can get character traits across in the eyes, you're golden and you're really gonna help your audience differentiate between your characters. For example, if you look at Midoriya or Uravity, they've got big round eyes with kind of the glints in them a lot of the time to make them look cute and friendly and just generally appealing and nice looking. But then in contrast, you've got characters like Bakugo or Takayama who are more serious and angry and they've got much more angular and aggressive looking eyes with smaller pupils that really makes them feel a lot more serious. And then you got someone like Froppy who's a friendly character but is a little bit odd and goofy. So she's got really big eyes but also kind of big pupils without the glints in them to make her, you know, a little bit strange looking. Ugh, as I'm talking about eyes, I've got something in my eye. That's ironic. And then someone like Tenya Ida who's you know, a nice and friendly character, but also a bit more serious. He's got eyes that are kind of a, a halfway point between someone like Deku and someone like Bakugo. And of course, he's got glasses to make him look a little bit more studious. And this idea of designing eyes differently is actually something that Scott McCloud talks about in Making Comics, which if you haven't heard of it and you want to make comics, I highly recommend it. And he talks about how he designed his character's eyes for Zot, which is another really great comic that's inspired by manga art and Western art, kind of a cool mash of the two. He's a genius when it comes to any kind of comic art. I recommend checking out a whole bunch of his work as well. But sorry, that's a tangent. Back to Kohei. As an aside, my personal favorite cover that I've seen for My Hero Academia is this one here. This is another one of those covers that I've talked about other covers that are like this one. I think I talked about an I Hate Fairyland cover that's very similar format to this. I also found a bunch of other examples of Horikoshi just doing sketches and drawings that have been put up online. The style between them switches up but also has, you know, his sort of vibe to it. And I think it's really cool how he does different proportions and cartoony manga sort of drawings. I really love the proportions on this character in particular and I'm gonna try drawing something like that in the near future. But all right everybody, that's all for this episode of Illustrator Reacts. There are a lot of other manga artists that I'd really like to talk about, but I didn't want to stretch any of these ones too thin, wanted to make sure they all got their time to shine. I'd actually planned on talking about Hiromu Arakawa because I think she's super interesting. I bought this book specifically to find something to talk about, but I just couldn't think up any good talking points. So who knows, maybe in the next one, if there's some specific art of hers that you think would be really good to talk about, I'd love if you sent it to me. I love getting requests for people to talk about. And if you think there's a specific image that you could link that would be really good for a specific artist that I might not have heard of, that would be super helpful as well. Put it in your comment. And thank you so much to everyone who's been so passionate about this series and this channel in general. I don't know if we're at 100K at the time this video is going out, but we're super close. Doing both these kinds of videos on this channel and my videos where I do stuff like draw Spider-Man villains in the Star Wars universe, Overwatch characters in Dungeons and Dragons. Everything about this channel has just been a dream to run. This is a dream job to me and it wouldn't be possible without all of you. So thank you all so much for being here. But that's all for this episode. I'm Christian Pearson. This has been Popcraft Studios, home of the nerdiest art videos on YouTube. And I will see you all in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.